what are we to do when we want to offer clinical advice, but the evidence just isn't there? There is not evidence that you should intervene early, but that doesn't mean that you don't intervene early. So when the, when the person is saying there's no evidence, you're going to say, you know what? There's not level one evidence, there's not level two evidence, but there is level five evidence, there's level four evidence, and there might be even level three evidence. And that's where the debate should be, is how strong is the evidence, not that there's no evidence. And now the research that we're doing out of the Breed Institute is we're talking about pairing frenuloplasty with myofunctional therapy in order to achieve those outcomes. And if you were to ask me, is there evidence? We're starting with level five, level four, and level three, because that's the way we're gonna advance the field. It's easy to just say someone has sleep apnea, but let's just take a look and see what this means when, uh, when they're sleeping throughout the night. So this is called drug-induced sleep endoscopy. We force patients into a state of sleep using medicines. And then we can observe to see how they react if we allow them to go into a deep, deep sleep. We're gonna start, we start the study at 4.34 a.m. and we wake up at 2.19. This oxygen level is so low, what's going on? Something wrong with their lungs? What's up? Does that make sense? If you're going to bed at night, you don't wanna fall asleep right away. You wanna fall asleep in about 10 or 15 minutes, okay? If you're falling asleep too quickly, that's a sign of excessive daytime sleepiness. You're, you're too sleepy. The tongue serves as an important scaffold for the development of the maxillary arch. But if you have mouth breathing issues for any reason, or you have a tongue tie issue, that's keeping the tongue low. The tongue cannot function adequately as a scaffold, and you get the dental crowding issues and a V-shaped arch. What we want is for the face to grow forward. We want the face to grow forward because as the bones grow forward, the soft tissue comes forward and that's gonna, how you're gonna open up your airway. So, so if someone's tongue is down, blocking the throat, right? You're trying to put CPAP in down their throat, not going to tolerate it well, and they're going to get an aversion to the CPAP. You, get the, you want to make sure the nose is clear and get the tongue up before you try to force them on CPAP. And it's upsetting to hear, like, you are not compliant, yeah. right? She is yeah. not compliant, right? Then this is not the right treatment for you, yeah. right? Yeah. Patients with UARS will have apnea hypopnea index less than five. They'll have oxygen levels throughout the night above 92%. Okay? and they'll have RDI's arousal index above 10. You know, we don't stop there. We have to get a sense of, of, of uh, what happens if we don't treat, what happens if we do treat. Okay? And so you can't say that every patient with UARS is going to have a heart attack, stroke, diabetes, cancer, all these issues. That's not, that's not true. The time spent below 90 is the time that you're at risk of having a heart attack or stroke. And so the purpose of going through all this is to kind of show you that there's a spectrum of pediatric sleep disorder breathing. Usually starts with mouth breathing or noisy breathing. And this is usually the first sign that something may be wrong. So here's a kid, maybe like Austin, maybe years earlier, who doesn't have sleep apnea. He never stops breathing. He doesn't lose any oxygen. But look at how much effort he has to do in order to breathe. You cannot be a, a mouth breather and have your tongue up. It doesn't work, you guys can try it. There's no way you can do it, okay? And so the most important thing is those three principles that we talked about, right? Uh, nasal breathing, lips together, tongue on the spot.